Hey, welcome. So before we get into this video, I uh, just want to kind of let you know what's up with the logo change and the name change on the uh, channel. Uh, decided to change this to Black Flag EMS. We actually have a meetup group called Black Flag EMS. And uh, so if you go to meetups, uh, meetup.com, you can search for Black Flag EMS and join that group and, and join in on the discussions and contribute. Um, so the idea behind Black Flag EMS is we're, we're trying to be a little bit different, <clears throat> a little bit less politically correct and just really focus on improving our skill sets and helping each other um, do the very best we can. So this video is on what I'm affectionately calling real world EMT EMR CPR. I kind of like how that rings. In any case, the idea here um, is to really think about and cover those things that don't get taught in your typical AHA uh, Red Cross CPR program. Um, and some of these things actually aren't even taught in the ACLS level, uh, although a good portion of them are. Uh, I love the ACLS program. Uh, I, I have gone through the ACLS program, and I urge all of you to go through it. Even though it, there's a lot of um, things that are ALS-focused, there is also a lot in the ACLS program related to BLS. But in any case, um, you know, the inspiration for this program is basically that, you know, um, I've seen and I've had people approach me after uh, CPR calls and really, you know, have concern about how the call, how they manage the call and that they weren't really prepared for that call. We're going to talk more about this. And so I thought it'd be interesting to really kind of step back and think about, you know, how do we manage the overall cardiac arrest patient in the BLS world? And you know, one of the things I will say is that the BLS foundation um, that we build uh, is critical uh, in the BLS, uh, in, in the cardiac arrest patient. Um, so with that, let's get into this and talk a little bit more about kind of um, what we're going to go through um, and why we did this. So first of all, I can tell you CPR is one of the most feared of all EMS responses, which means uh, that we tend to get this wrong. Right. Um, it, it, you know, we we go through the training we go through typically focuses on, you know, our performance of compressions, ventilation, um, you know, adequate ventilation, uh, lookless and feel, you know, uh, AED placement, analysis, shock, uh, identifying uh, ROSC. And, and maybe, you know, how do we transition between um, compression of ventilation or compression uh, you know, uh, compressor to compressor, the person doing the compressions. But we rarely step back or in our training talk about the complexity of a cardiac arrest patient. And I think this goes back to what I was saying. I've had a lot of people that, you know, are overwhelmed, right? They go into a cardiac arrest call and they're really overwhelmed. They, they haven't really been taught or given the experience of how do you organize this call for the maximum effectiveness. And really in this program, what I'm trying to do is really help us improve our quality of managing a cardiac arrest situation. So the first context here is, is, you know, so this is kind of kind of part of the foundation of why we're doing this. The program itself is appropriate for EMRs, EMTs, AEMTs, and paramedics, but it is really focused on BLS. We're not going to get into any of the advanced stuff, very little of the ACLS stuff. It's really how do we do a much better job of BLS, right? Uh, and how how do we build on that foundation? Now, I am assuming that you know CPR, so you hopefully have that foundation. You understand, you know, compression ventilation ratios for uh, adults, children, pediatrics, and infants. Um, so, you know, you you need to have that. I'm not going to get into compression ratios and all that. We're going to talk a little bit about a few things that you know, as you care for the patient and you involve ALS, you may change. But we're not going to get into the foundations, the basics here. If you don't understand CPR, you're not comfortable with CPR itself, then you need to go get that taken care of. What we're talking about here is how do we manage the entire situation? Um, and, and you'll see what I mean as we go through this. Uh, you know, this is really kind of, um, I'm, you know, I'm not trying to be tongue in cheek, or maybe I am, you know, but we're out of school with this, right? We've gotten our CPR. We, we understand, as I just mentioned, our compression and ventilation ratios. We understand compression depth and, and these things. But we're in the moment 
And these are very tr uh, trying situations. Typically, you know, cardiac arrest calls are going to involve family members. They're going to be, um, you know, distraught and maybe screaming and trying to figure out what to do. They may grab you. They may touch you. Um, it is a, you know, situation where... <clears throat> You know, there could be body fluids, there could be uh, secondary uh, challenges to the patient beyond just the cardiac arrest situation. We could be in an outdoor environment. Um, you know, typically we're not going to be in a classroom, um, but we could be in the rain. We could be, um, you know, in, in a... <clears throat> Uh, a night situation, limited light, confined space. So these, everything in here is about how do we deal with that chaos that is a cardiac arrest call. And some of you will say, well, that's how we deal with, you know, we have this with every call, but cardiac arrest is, is a very, it is a complicated call in a complicated situation if you want to do it effectively, if you want to raise the bar. And, and here's the thing, I think I read somewhere that, you know, only about 11% of patients uh, survive a cardiac arrest despite best efforts. Um, and so anything we can do to increase the quality of care by even 1% is a huge win, right? And our job is to battle to get that 1%. So I'm hoping that this program gives you insights, right? I, I don't profess to know it all. There may be things that you disagree with. So right size this for you or help contribute and, and, and evolve what I'm thinking here. And most of all, think about how do we fight to get just one more percent, get from 11 percent survival rate to 12. And then we can figure out 13, 14 and 15 and, and keep that ball rolling. So my hope is that this is complementary training to what you would typically learn in an EMT, even an ACLS or a CPR program. Um, so with that, I want to give you some context, right? There's some assumptions I'm making. I'm setting a stage here, and it's important you understand this. First thing is that obviously the scene, the scene, your team, and your team is safe, right? We know this is paramount to everything we do. You have at least two responders trained at least to the EMR level. Now, I'm going to tell you right up front, one of the things you're going to learn right off the bat is you will not be successful in most cases um, with just two people uh, responding to a cardiac arrest. You'll see why in just a moment. Um, in the context of this, we're assuming that CPR is already being performed, right? We're not getting to the scene and there is no CPR. The only exception to that is if we were in a situation where a patient deteriorated and went into cardiac arrest while we were trying to uh, determine either their MOI or NOI. But the important part here is we're assuming for this that CPR has already been started um, and you're addressing that, I guess, is the best way to think about it is this is everything you're going to learn here is not about how do you start CPR. You already know that. Again, that's your foundational training from your CPR training or BLS resuscitation programs. So you know how to do that and you should do that before you apply anything else here. So we're assuming CPR has been started. Uh, this program, I'm taking this from the perspective of volunteer agencies, whether that's uh, EMS, fire rescue, whatever it may be, um, a law enforcement EMS unit, lifeguards. Um, the idea here is we, you know, but we are keeping professional standards. Now, I'm mentioning this because a lot of the challenges that volunteer organizations face um, contribute to the ability for us to effectively manage a cardiac arrest situation. When you have a paid unit, there's typically more resources that can be brought to bear uh, and, and makes life a little bit different for everybody. I'm also, uh, you know, the context here is that you have standard equipment. You have a BLS uh, airway adjuncts with you. You have O2, BVM, nasal cannulas, ADs, longboards, scoops, whatever it is. But you have these things, okay? So, um, you know, you, you've got everything you need. Again, this isn't about you know, the basics. This is about how we manage this. All right, so let's jump into this. We're going to look at this from a few different cornerstones. Right? There's a few cornerstones I think you have to have in place or you have to do well in order to raise that bar and manage a cardiac arrest situation effectively. Um, first, you got to establish a foundation. You have to have somebody be the boss. You've got to manage the patient. You have to integrate effectively ALS, ACLS care. You have to be able to evacuate that patient at a, in a high quality professional manner. You have to figure out your lessons learned and you, we, you know, ultimately you have to think about some ground truth, some things that we may not want to hear, but are really important for this to all work. So we're going to dive into each one of these and, and kind of figure out uh, what, I'm, what I'm actually talking about with these cornerstones, give you some insights into them. So let's start with establishing a foundation. 
First of all, and this isn't going to be the most politically correct, but I'm giving you a politically correct title just to help some of you get through this. But listen, somebody has to be the patient care coordinator. I like to say, who is the boss? Right now, this is probably obvious. And, and for every call you do, you should have somebody who's going to be the boss or quote unquote patient care coordinator or patient lead or care lead, whatever you want to call it. But it's the boss and they need to be in charge. But when we talk about cardiac arrest, I also believe this is, is critical for trauma, uh, multi-system trauma situations. But for cardiac arrest, you do need somebody that's going to be the boss. And that boss needs to focus on, most importantly, what resources do you need and what, uh, what resources do you have? Now, <clears throat> you're going to see in a moment that you cannot effectively manage a cardiac arrest situation with just two responders. Um, it, it's very, very hard to do. Uh, you know, there are a lot of things that will play into that from just the ineffectiveness of maintaining a seal with a BVM to how do you manage fatigue if, if this is a prolonged compression challenge. Uh, there's, you know, a lot that goes in. So you need resources. The question is, how many resources do you need? And I want you to relax for a moment because you're going to see we need a lot of resources for cardiac arrest. So, and, and, and we'll do that in a moment. But from the boss perspective, establishing this foundation, you need to think about this acronym that I created called BAMS. Actually, it came from me from Bam Bam from the Flintstones, for any of you familiar with that, and now you know how old I am. Um, but BAMS, I think, is an important little kind of memory jog for you that if you are the boss, if you're in charge of this situation, what you should be thinking about. So first thing is, who runs the code, right? That's the first piece of this, which we've kind of talked about. Second thing is what assets are needed. Now you need not just to think about the equipment you're jumping out of your rig with or establishing on the scene, but what's your pathway of care? Will you need additional equipment that you may need 5, 10, 15 minutes into this situation? So you need to think about your pathway, right? Your, your asset pathway. What else am I going to need here? Right? Am I going to need longboard? Am I going to need scoop? Am I going to need a stair chair? Am I going to, you know, how are you moving this patient? We're going to talk more about that in a few moments. But what is the pathway of care? Because that will dictate your equipment requirements. Manpower. You're going to need a lot of manpower. We've mentioned this a couple times. You'll see in a moment just how much manpower you typically need. But take away from this, it's more than you think. You know, you need medics, right? So a key part of this is our medics in route. I'm assuming you work in a multi-tier system. Uh, you don't have medics on board then you need to know, are they in route? What's their ETA and how are they getting here, right? Um, so it's really critical, you know, that you understand those things right from the get-go, right? Is, is, are they in route? What's the ETA and how are they getting here? Why, how? Because you may need to factor that into your on-scene decisions. And then safety, look, resuscitation is messy, you know, and you need to have PPE. It is a key thing that a lot of people forget when we're dealing with it. You have family members yelling at you, help them, help them. You may have police like waving at you to get there. Uh, you know, you need to step and, and think about your PPE requirements. Obviously, most of us know we try to don PPE in route to the call. But, you know, again, some of uh, from a volunteer perspective, some may be responding from uh, home or from work or from some other location and you you may or may not be able to throw PPE on while you're driving so but you need to pause and again safety is paramount take care of yourself there's going to be a lot of a lot of fluids a lot of uh, regurgitation aerosolization um, that you need to be concerned about okay so let's say you're the boss Right. And you we, we need to talk a little bit about what do you do? What's your job? And I think this starts really giving us that construct of the stuff that we may not get in class, but we really need to get good at in order to effectively manage a cardiac arrest. So in route to the scene. Now, again, this is going to be a little challenging if you can't respond from quarters as a team. If you are responding, uh, having multiple people respond from multiple locations, this is something uh, that gets a little harder. You may have to actually do some of the things we talk about here on the scene. But in an ideal situation, you would do this in route to the scene. So, um, you know, first thing to keep in mind about being the boss is you do not directly do patient care. You oversee patient care. This is vitally important. You are going to position yourself where you can see 
the patient. You can see all the caregivers. You can see your equipment. You can think about you know, how you got in and how you're going to get out. You can see overall scene, how the scene is developing, how patient care is evolving. So if you are involved with the patient, that's a key indicator you don't have enough resources. There are a lot of things for you to think about as the, 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 bo the boss, the patient care coordinator. Obviously, again, this is ideal. So I don't need a bunch of you coming back to me and going, well, we don't have you know, as many people as we need. Or you know, obviously, if I can't do patient care, then it's not going to get done. You, know, you need to solve problems on the way. I'll explain some of that in a moment. Um, you typically, your boss is going to be the highest certified person, not you know, the, the line officer or the, um, you know, whatever your, your agency uses to denote rank. Uh, rank does not equate to um, highest level of certification always. Uh, it also may not equate to the highest level of certification and experience, right? Many times senior members or senior officers or officers um, and, and in a well-run organization, your officers typically should be worried about the administration and management of the field operations. And typically that means they're going to give up some of their skills in order to become better at managing operations. And, and if that's one, you know, we're not going to get into this video, but I can tell you when you see that you have officers that are really hands-on with patient care, that's usually an indicator of, of a bad leadership. Um, the other side of this is... <clears throat> You know, we're dealing with a complex situation. A lot's going on here. So having somebody who has the highest level of certification and experience is critical to patient outcomes. So just something to think about that you may have a lieutenant, a captain, whatever it may be, a chief, uh, and, you know, they should delegate or, you know, uh, acquiesce to whoever the highest certified person is, and that should be the boss. So when you're selecting your boss, or this cardiac arrest, think about who would be the best person to manage this situation. Um, <clears throat> now, one mistake I will tell you that I often see is where you have somebody managing the situation and somebody managing patient care. You need to have kind of an orchestrate, an, a, a true orchestration of this, and both things have to be balanced. So here's the manpower request, and I told you, a lot of you are going to be like, oh my gosh. Listen, the challenge here is that typically when we think of cardiac arrest, we're thinking of a nice sanitized classroom environment where we have a mannequin and we're, we're doing our 30 to 2 or 15 to 2, depending on, on, on age and, and amount of rescuers. But there is a lot to do. And, and this is something that the ACLS program does a good job at presenting, but I don't think it does a good job at actually helping us embrace this. For you to manage a cardiac arrest, and I want you to think about when you go to the hospital, for those of you that have dealt with a, a cardiac arrest situation, how many people in the hospital are involved in that patient care once you transfer? You know, if you've ever seen a rapid response team, a clinical rapid response team in a hospital, they have eight to ten people, right? They have multiple people involved, and each one has a specific job. So we're basically, you know, taking a lesson from that. If you go to a trauma center, you will see that there are a bunch of people involved. When we have critical patients, we need to have resources. So here's what we kind of need. We need two people on airway, right? We want an effective seal. We want airway adjuncts. We want, <clears throat> you know, high flow oxygen. That takes at least two people, right? It's not just get the BVM on. You know, time is of the essence. We want to make sure we get the appropriate adjunct in place. We want to make sure that, you know, we are uh, focused on that seal. We want to make sure that we've got our oxygen set up. We're going to talk about that a little bit more in a bit, but you need at least two people. You're obviously going to have one person on compressions, actively doing compressions. You, if you can, you want one person uh, getting the AED set up, pad placement, um, things like that. You want one person on transport. This is the person that's going to figure out how they get the stretcher, how they get um, <clears throat> supporting transport equipment, long boards, short boards, stair chair, um, things of that nature. Um, <clears throat> we need one person on time management. Their job is literally to watch the time. They're watching how much time is going on on the scene. They should be calling out in two minute increments, two minutes, two minutes, two minutes, or more effectively, two minutes, four minutes, six minutes, eight minutes, 10 minutes, giving you as the boss, one, an idea of how long you're on this scene, two, how long CPR is progressing, three, also determining um, when you need to switch your compressor out, right? When you need to rotate. Um, that brings also to the family. You need to get the family away from your scene and allow you to manage that scene. Now, you can't move them, obviously, typically, but you can have one person, hopefully, comforting the family, 
keeping them occupied so you can focus. You don't need them screaming, yelling. You also don't need them becoming patients. So if you can get to them and focus on them, you hopefully avoid a syncope or something else. They could have, you could have a situation where somebody freaks out and has a heart attack. And now you have a second cardiac arrest situation. So you really need to think about how that helps you maintain the quality of your primary patient who right now is in cardiac arrest. And then if you can, two spares. The spares are people that are going to support compressions. They're going to do running, meaning they may have to get other equipment. They may need to guide in the paramedics if they haven't responded with you. They may need to do a variety of different things, right? So you need two people who you can assign based on the requirements of the scene. And then there's you, right? So <clears throat> this is kind of brings to light the complexity of a cardiac arrest. We're not just going in and dealing with this with two or three providers. We have to have a plethora of people, and each one of them has to have a job, and we have to con you know, be the, the orchestra conductor who brings all of this together and makes sure that everybody knows their job, is on their job, and that we highly have high-quality execution of that job. So you as this as the boss really are responsible for assigning those jobs. Now, again, if you, you know, perfect world, uh, you could have everybody respond from quarters. Um, on the other hand, you know, if you have people responding from different locations, they may arrive at different times. You need to, while you're on scene, then assign jobs as people arrive. Uh, you also need to prioritize, and, and, and this list is prioritized, right? You want somebody to focus on airway and compressions. You want somebody to get AED done. You want somebody to uh, transport or support transport uh, operations, time management, and then the family, and then spares. Now, you may need to get involved here, um, and, and we're going to talk about that in a moment, is what happens if you have to be involved, even temporarily until you get more people on the scene. What are you doing? Uh, so even if you don't have everybody in, quote unquote, the rig or, or responding with you, then you need to think about who's going to do what uh, and then how you're going to parlay out those uh, those responsibilities, those jobs as people do arrive on scene. A big thing here is if you're not the boss and you're assigned a job, you need to make sure you have your assets, right? You're responsible for your assets. If you're told you're going to be managing airway, then you need to make sure you have the BVM, the cannulas, the oxygen tubing, you know, all the stuff you need uh, in order to do that job. If you're doing compressions, um, you know, you, you need to think about, um, you know, depth and rate and all of those things. You're resp responsible for that job. If you're the AED person, you are responsible for the AED. So again, you know, the boss isn't going to try and figure it all out. They're giving responsibility to people and saying, this is yours to own and you have to own it. So that's kind of uh, that piece of that. Uh, let's talk about you get to the scene uh, and what are we thinking about here? So first of all, you got to identify and deal with complexities. Every scene is going to have complexities. Uh, you need to think about you know, where is this patient? Um, how are we going to get to him? How are we going to get out? How are we going to coordinate other resources that are inbound? You know, there are going to be complexities. So you need to think about those very quickly and as, uh, as, as, as you know, soon as possible. Um, you need to formulate a patient management plan and verbalize that plan, right? So the patient may be prone. Your plan is going to be, let's get them supine. You know, are we going to do SMR? Are we going to rule out cervical? You know, what are we doing? Are you going to do a quick assessment to rule out, you know, um, a trachea, a trach? Uh, you know, you have to remember that even if CPR is being done by bystanders and law enforcement or someone else, they may have not thought about these things. These are not, you know, everything we're talking about here are not things that typically are going to be taught, as we mentioned, in a CPR or even an EMT program. So you need to be thinking, what do we need to do to deal with this patient? Not just, are we doing compressions and are we doing uh, airway? Yes, that's the core foundation, but you need to think about, how am I going to deal with this patient? What am I going to do? How am I evolving that care? And we'll talk more about that in, in just a moment. You need to think about your evacuation plan. This is something you can't wait to do. Um, you you need to think about uh, how you're going to get this patient out. And we sometimes, you know, get caught up in the cardiac arrest and we're not thinking of that. Now, you can assign that to the transport person and they could come up with a plan. But you as the boss need to at least start thinking about not just how you're going to evacuate this patient, but when. How long do you want to be on scene? Right? Do you want to be four minutes, 10 minutes? You know, are you going to wait for paramedics to show up? 
what is your evacuation plan? And that's part of your time management. You know, you want to evaluate the quality and job roles. You know, is the airway person doing the job? Are they thinking about chest rise? Or is, there, is the patient demonstrating gastric distension? Uh, you know, we'll talk about some other things you need to think about with the patient. And when we do, you need to think about these are the things you need to be thinking about as the boss. If you want to raise the bar and raise the effectiveness of managing that cardiac arrest patient, you as the boss need to be coordinating what we're about to talk about with patient management. There's going to be disputes you need to manage those. You may have somebody who's doing airway telling the person doing compressions, they're not doing something and they're saying, yes, I am. Either way, you have to respect, everybody has to respect the boss and the boss makes the call. If somebody has a dispute, check to make sure that the feed that they is given is uh, not incorrect, right? They may be giving uh, appropriate feedback to help improve patient care and the person receiving that feedback is stressed out. This is a high stress situation. Most people don't like doing cardiac arrest calls. And so you need to, as the boss, make sure that you keep in mind you're responsible, you know, um, for the overall quality of the situation, including the quality of the patient care. You know, consider additional resources, you know, you, based on your evacuation plan, the patient management plan, the people that you've been able to, to uh, involve in the care of the patient and assign to jobs, do you need more resources, right? Get an update on your, your paramedic units. You know, what is it that you need? And you need to be thinking of that. What else do I need, right? Um, <clears throat> don't try to get caught up in what do I need to do unless you have limited resources. And if you do, if you're doing the work, you have limited, there's one of two things happening here. Either you have limited resources, you need more resources. So get more resources and keep doing your job to those resources arrive and then transition that responsibility. Or B, honestly, you're just an egotistical, self-centered person and you can't give up control and you shouldn't be doing this kind of work. It's just bottom line, right? The person's life's on the line. You know, you need to step back and delegate. Um, you need to get a paramedic update and a decision. Are you waiting for paramedics? Are you going to intercept uh, or are you just going and getting to the hospital? Here's something to keep in mind. ALS, ACLS care is critical to the survival of the patient, but it is not as critical as a faulty BLS foundation. So focus on your BLS foundation, assuring that you have strong airway management, oxygenation, and you're dealing with circulation, uh, circulation, right? And, and supporting secondary challenges like aspiration and things like that. Focus on getting your patient evacuated and packaged. Think about the complexities of the scene. Manage the BLS environment. You know, yes, again, ACLS, ALS makes a huge difference, but you need to start thinking about how do you build a really strong BLS foundation that ALS and ACLS care can, can, can be built upon. You know, the reality of life here is that if you don't have a strong BLS foundation in a patient, then the ALS providers have to build that BLS foundation when they get to the scene. And, and that's, that's just a waste of time. So focus on that. You do need the paramedic update and decision, but don't sacrifice a strong BLS foundation for advanced life support. You know, monitoring the patient status, you have to monitor them. We've already mentioned a few things. We're going to talk a few more things, but where is this patient? Right? Uh, are they deteriorating even further? Now you may think like, well, they're cardiac arrest. How much more could they deteriorate? They actually can be further deterioration, and typically that is a sign of ineffective treatment. Right? If your patient is continuing to deteriorate, then there is something wrong in your equation. You either your airway is not effective, there's uh, oxygenation is not being done properly, or cardiac compressions are off, or something else is happening here. Right? And you need to understand that if you're seeing even you can see improvement without ROSC. And that's something that, again, we may not think about in the BLS world, but we can see improvement in patients that are under cardiac arrest, slight improvements right, that start hopefully driving them down a path of recovery. But what we don't want to see is deterioration. And most importantly, we want to not just overlook uh, patient status. Right. Uh, you need to get arrest times. How long is this patient? When did they arrest? Uh, how long has CPR been going on? Uh, what was happening before the CPR uh, was started? What was the patient doing? You know, if you can get a quick medical history, great. Uh, but focus on, again, your BLS foundation. But these things are important because they will be important to both the paramedics and the hospital. The problem here is you have to do all of this simultaneously. And this is important. 
Uh, and let's talk a little bit about what happens if you have limited resources. So let's just say you have two people that are arrive on scene. You don't have any other resources. You know, I'm telling you, you need all these other resources. You can't wait for those resources. You have to begin CPR um, and, and, you know, right now, right? So here's the thing. If you are the boss, even with two people, you can have a boss. My suggestion to you is you focus on airway. Let the other provider focus on compressions. As you're doing airway management, you know, you have typically, let's talk if you're in an adult situation, you have 30 compressions. That's a bunch of time for you to go through some of these checklists, thinking about, do I have any complexities? What's my plan? How's the patient doing? You know, are we having, you know, is the compression level quality? Am I doing effective, you know, airway management? So you can do this. Again, these are not things that we typically are being tested on, you know, is our level of processing the information. So I have managed codes where, where I've had to participate in the code and yet do all these other things, including as people are coming on scene, giving them jobs and making sure they're doing whatever job is needed. Um, so if you end up in this situation and you're starting with airway and somebody comes on the scene, get them on the airway. Maybe you do move to two person airway, right? You continue bagging and the other person manages, you know, the, the, the uh, seal uh, or they're supporting the AD efforts, but give people jobs and get yourself freed up as soon as you can. So you can conduct the overall situation. And you may, yes, you may have to switch to compressions. But if you're doing compressions, focus on your compressions. Uh, and then during the, the ventilation cycle, try to think about at least one or two things that you need to check. One of the most important things to think about is quality and scene time management, right? Are you needing to get off this scene and possibly do an intercept or get this patient to a hospital? And how are you going to do that? So let's switch now to patient management, right? So in this situation, <clears throat> you know, we need to think about relieving the on-scene personnel. If you come on the scene and there's already people doing CPR, just assume they're tired and they're ineffective. So try to get your resources. Again, if you don't have resources, if you only have one or two people, you may need to enlist the support of the people on scene. They could be first responders. They could be CPR certified personnel, whatever it may be. But in an ideal situation, right, we're going to start with ideal and work backwards. In an ideal situation, we're going to get whoever's performing CPR when we arrive, you know, relieved. We don't dismiss them. We can always bring them back into the equation if we need them, because if you only have two or three people, right, we're now in a non-ideal situation. You start by for having fresh people involved, and then you can bring back one of the other people that was performing CPR if you deem that they were doing it effectively and appropriately. If not, you can, and they seem to know what they're doing, you can coach them, right? So point is, get them a break, and you can bring them back in the game. Compression quality is absolutely critical, right? You need to, as we're thinking in the prior slides, we said if you're the boss, you're thinking about that patient quality of care, you know, we need to be thinking about how effective is, is our compressions. You know, are the, is the depth appropriate? Is the recoil, right? Recoil is paramount. You know, adequate depth is critical, right? But recoil is extremely important. And a lot of times we see that people don't let up. We, we, we see by body position in compressions and we're not letting up on the chest. And without doing that, we will impact ventilation and more importantly, oxygenation. Um, and we'll talk more about that in a moment. But, you know, start with what is my compression quality, right? Is it there or not? You, know, you need to, as the boss, evaluate and improve the airway if possible. Now, obviously, each person has a job. So you're basically second checking. You're, you're giving, you're, you're doing a second check of that job. So you need to be doing a lot of things. But obviously, if I'm doing airways and you're the boss, I should be focused on how can I evaluate and improve this airway. That's my responsibility. But as the boss, I expect you to hopefully, you know, check my work, right? So to do that, you know, my view if I'm dealing with cardiac arrest, NPA is my airway of choice. You know, I'm fighting against time here. So I will do an NPA. Obviously, if there's a contradiction, I won't do it. But I will go to NPA over OPA in pretty much everything, but especially in cardiac arrest, simply because if I get paramedics on scene, if I get to the hospital, you know, yeah, it only takes a tenth of a second to get an OPA out. Uh, but I don't want to take that tenth of a second, right? I want to get advanced intubation. I want to set up for that. I'm assuming that's going to occur when the paramedics get here and when we get to the hospital. So I'm 
I'm going to go NPA, there's no deficiency or, 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 or change in, in uh, oxygenation levels or airway management with NPA versus OPA. Um, the other thing here is if we get to an aspiration situation, uh, we need to have a, a better way of doing suctioning. Um, and, and it's just easier to do that without anything on the uh, OPA, um, <clears throat> without an LPA. And again, now are we suction ready? So if I'm managing airway, if I'm thinking of airway, I'm dealing with, you know, okay, do I have suction available if I need it? What am I going to do? I'm trying to get ahead of, we talked about earlier, our asset pathway. What assets do I need as I continue to evolve my care? And this is kind of examples of that. Uh, ventilation is absolutely important, obviously. Oxygenation is critical. If you can ventilate all day long, uh, and you can have adequate chest rise. And if you're not seeing oxygenation improvements, um, you have a problem. So we need to think about how we're dealing with that. How do we have, how do we get the upper hand on oxygenation? Um, so first of all, is it getting an effective seal? Right, that's that's critical. If we have an effective seal um, on the patient through the uh, BVM mask, then we're going to have a much better chance of not only improving our ability to ventilate, but also oxygen delivery. So here's a couple of things. If you don't know what Thenar MNS is, it's a way to seal the mask. I don't know. Typically, it's not taught, I don't believe, in CPR and EMT classes or EMR. Uh, this is, if you don't know how to do this, it's a really great way to, uh, as long as you don't have any kind of spinal challenges, um, to get a really strong, strong seal on a patient as well as improve uh, their airway. One of the things I find a lot of times is when we're doing CPRs, we forget, or any BVM actually, airway uh, management, is we don't get uh, the airway open. We have an effective seal without opening the airway. In fact, our, our, the, the force of the seal that we're trying to apply impacts the airway because we're pressing the chin down. Uh, with the TE approach, the Stenar MNS, you actually correct for that and you have an effective seal while managing the airway. Uh, beards, these are again, things that we don't think about in our class. What if your patient has a big beard, right? Like they're, they're a Santa Claus person, right? Uh, what do you do? How do you get an effective seal with that? Uh, one trick is lubricate the seal, uh, the, lubricate the mask, uh, and so it causes a suction on the patient, pushing into that beard. Um, you can pat the beard down, you can water it down to try and get it moved out of the way. But you know, if you have a beard and you don't deal with that, you're not going to have effective suction or seal, and then you're not going to have effective ventilation, which obviously leads to ineffective oxygenation. What are the challenges can you have, right? We can have dentures, we can have facial trauma. These are the things that we have to account for as part of our overall quality management of this patient. And as the boss, you should be double checking these things, right? Especially if we have newer people on the team, you know, cardiac arrests don't occur every day. These are perishable skills. Uh, chest rise report, right? You know, are we getting chest rise? Um, you know, is there distension, right? These are the little things obviously we all know, but we often forget in the middle of the crisis. Um, patient color, this is a critical impact. You know, if you have a patient, and this is what we're going to get into, are we monitoring patient status? If the patient is becoming cyanotic, if they're continuing to, to deteriorate in terms of what the skin color is telling us, uh, then we need to take action. Right. We need to figure out how to improve that situation. And there's one of, you know, again, it's only a couple things we have to adjust here. Either we're not getting adequate ventilation. We don't have a good seal. We're not getting uh, or we're not providing enough uh, ventilation force, uh, tidal volume. We're not getting oxygenation or we're not doing effective chest compressions, meaning either the recall is not happening or we don't have enough depth. You as the boss need to kind of take that snapshot and figure out. Remember, each person is doing their job uh, and they should be focused on that job. So, you know, but sometimes stress, the moment, fatigue uh, can all play into this. And you have to step back and continue to help manage that patient um, and, and make sure that we're doing the right things here. Um, you know, one thing that will become vital is especially with the paramedics getting on scene or AMT, AEMTs, um, or even, you know, some EMT, uh, depending on local protocol, may have access to this. Getting the patient ETCO2, their carbon, uh, carbon dioxide levels, um, to um, 35 to 45 mmHg is critical, right? So if you want to measure effectiveness of how well you're doing, look at that. Uh, especially once you have paramedics or AEMTs on scene and they've connected to a capnography, you should, if you're managing the airway, try to glance at that and see if you're doing an effective job or if you're the boss, figure out you know where they're at. Uh, and that's a great support for the paramedics while they're trying to get drugs set up. Uh, they may be looking at figuring out how to get to advanced airway. 
So you can try to help that, especially with advanced airway. You can think about pre-oxygenation levels, uh, and some of that can be done through capnography. So you can just look at their monitor and determine, you know, uh, is the patient 35 to 45? And if not, how do you need to adjust? Again, we're not going to get into the, the medicine of this. Uh, if you want to know more, feel free to reach out or we can discuss uh, or take an ACLS class. Nasal cannula. Um, you know, you got a patient, oxygen is their friend right now. Now, there's some, some small issues with managing EC, uh, the ETCO2, but for the most part, we want to dump as much oxygen we can into this patient. So adding a nasal cannula uh, to the BVM, uh, as well as that BVM obviously being on oxygen, is critical. Right, get that nasal cannula in. Again, this is you have two people on airway management. Uh, you have sp hopefully some spares if you don't, but try to get that nasal cannula in. Now, if you have to choose between BVM on high flow oxygen and nasal cannula, um, go to BVM, right? That's your first line of defense. But if you have the personnel, get that nasal cannula in that patient uh, and start going down that path. <clears throat> you know, AED placement. Um, a couple things here to shave or not shave, you shave. Right. If the patient has any chest hair, AED pads are very, very sensitive. They have to be placed correctly. They have to have a tight seal. And if there's anything that is dealing, is, is not allowing for that seal to create. So even small amounts of chest hair can stop that seal from occurring, which the AED interprets as a inappropriate pad placement. And it will continue to tell you to readjust the pads. What is happening during that time? A bunch of stuff, right? The patient is going to continue deteriorating. We can't determine, you know, we have to get to early defibrillation. We want to shock the patient if there's a shockable rhythm as soon as we can. So, you know, that is obviously a big challenge. But we also are continuing the fatigue of the rescuers. We continue our stress. Here's the thing. If somebody's got to keep adjusting, keep adjusting that, that pad, they're going to get stressed out. If they're getting stressed out, everybody else is getting stressed out. If the entire team is getting stressed out, the family members are getting stressed out. And ultimately, our quality level drops. So, if you have moderate, any kind of hair, shave. Shave aggressively. That's the second thing. Sometimes when I've seen people shave chest hair, you're trying to shave as if you're shaving your significant other and you don't want to cut them. Um, you got to shave aggressively here. First thing, you know, make the skin taut. Use one hand to get the skin of the patient as taut as you can and then shave, right? And drag that shaver, you know, oh, what if I cut them? If you cut them and they complain, guess what? They're ROSC and you have a victory party, okay? So get, you know, obviously I'm, I'm not being serious. You don't want to cut them, right? We don't need fluid. We don't need a wet surface. That screws up the AEDs as well. My point of this is shave to get the hair off as quickly as possible and get the AED placed on. Same thing with dry or not dry. Dry the patient. Again, the AED pads and the analysis, the algorithm run by the AED is very sensitive to anything that interrupts a complete contact of that pad with the patient's skin. So you need to really make sure the patient's skin is dry. <clears throat> there's no hair and obviously all the other stuff we're taught around not showing there's transdermal patches or anything else, scarring, things that are going to interfere with a good contact of the AED placement. But this is an area that you as the boss need to be looking at and thinking about, are we being effective in terms of dropping this AED uh, pad in place? Um, look, speed, you know, uh, here's a saying for you to keep in mind, right? Smooth is fast. Uh, uh, Slow is smooth and smooth is fast. Uh, what that means is simply, if when you're doing the AD placement, don't just slap it on there. Put it on purposely and slowly, kind of like you're petting a, a dog or a cat, right? There should be some firm pressure because you're trying to get out any air bubbles, any bumps. Just get it on and, and you'll see that your success rate of AD plaid placement goes way up when you can take it uh, slow. You know, the point here is you're better off doing it one time slowly and correctly than eight times readjusting, trying to get it right. Now it sticks to itself. You have to unstick it. And again, we're back to the stress ball. So focus on that. Okay, so now we've got, a, we've got the patient management underway. We've got our jobs. Next thing is, how do we integrate the paramedics, right? So first thing is, get a paramedic briefing. If you are the boss and you're able to, you know, you have the ability, you, you have to at some point give that briefing. Even if you're, you're hands-on with the patient, you need to provide that briefing to the patient. Uh, so give the briefing. You want it simple, right? We don't need to go through all their meds and allergies and all that. There will be time for that once we get ALS integration completed. 
But most importantly, how did this, when did this happen? We, paramedics need to know how long has this person been, you know, out? How long has the cardiac arrest progre- uh, been, been uh, when was it first, uh, how long has it been since it started? Uh, we need to, you know, figure out if we've shocked the patient. If the AED has shocked the patient, you need to know how, you know, how many times and how many minutes since the last shock. And obviously, if the patient has not uh, had achieved ROSC, then you're continuing your compressions and CPR. Um, the other thing is note and record the time of the shock. Uh, state and status. What is the patient's state? You know, they've continued to get become cyanotic. The patient has, um, you know, aspirated twice. Um, you know, we, we, we did get ROSC and then we lost it. What is that? Uh, patient status. You know, the patient fell. Uh, there may be trauma. This is a quick briefing so the paramedics can understand what they're dealing with and then they're going to assume care, right? Now, uh, and also you may want to give them your plan. Our plan is, you know, let you guys do your thing and, and then we're going to, we, you know, we're on the third floor here. We're going to have a challenge with the elevator. We got to get them out, right? They need to understand what challenges have already been identified, what complexities of the scene have already been identified and what's your plan to address them. Do not put that plan on the paramedics, right? You need to focus on letting them do ALS stuff, right? Um, second thing is, you know, you need to determine with the paramedics, will the airway evolve or will you maintain current state? So if we have an NPA in, are the paramedics like, that's good enough, let's start transport, or are they going to innovate on scene or innovate in the ambulance? What do they want to do? Are they going to evolve airway management or not? They will tell you that. You can ask, you know, you guys want to innovate here? Do you want to, what do you want to do? Right. They're pro- give them a minute or two. Right. They can't just tell you that by looking at the patient, but you need to start that communication or whoever's on airway management, whoever has that responsibility should be thinking about that. And the reason for that um, is you're going to need to think about how to coordinate that change. If you're doing BVM and you have an OPA or NP, if you have an OPA in, the OPA has got to come out. You got to open the mouth. They've got to get a tube in. You need to figure out how to help the paramedics with that, right? Now, maybe not hands-on, but there will be transition. They're going to get the tube in. They're going to want you to immediately get that that BVM reconnected. You know, a bunch of things you have to do to help that, right? So that is, again, something most of us don't practice is how do we coordinate that swap from either from an OPA to uh, advanced airway management. Again, this is another reason I like the NPAs. Uh, you know, you're going to need to swap the AED for the cardiac monitor and defibrillator. Again, how, how are you going to do that? Typically, they will do that, but you're going to have cords. They're going to get tangled. You've got your AED in the way. How do you get that out of there effectively so they have their workspace, right? Continue to focus on high-quality BLS care. Your job isn't done. The paramedics have shown up. You have built a BLS foundation. They are going to build on top of that, right? They're going to build the first floor of the house, the second floor, through a bunch of different things that they can do on the ALS and ACLS side. Now, the only way those things work, if, if, if look, if, if, if the paramedics do uh, administer epinephrine or they administer um, some other antiarrhythmic, um, whatever they do, it doesn't work without circulation, so if you stop doing your job and you're not circulating that drug, uh, it's not going to do much, right? If you're not oxygenating and we don't have tissue perfusion, it's not going to go very far. So maintaining high quality BLS management is absolutely critical for effective ALS, ACLS. So your job isn't done. Don't just turn it over to the paramedics, right? Uh, now they are in charge of patient care at this point. But I don't know of a situation where paramedics are going to be of the mindset that, hey, BLS people, you can go home now. Uh, that would be very strange to me. I, I'd be, I don't know, maybe there is a situation, but I can't think of one. You need to continue to effectively manage the patient as a single team, and you as the boss need to continue being the boss. Now, you're not any longer in charge of the patient, but you can help coordinate that care as well as manage the scene and provide updates to the paramedics, and they will provide and communicate with you. And that's critical, right? That they also know there's a point of contact for them so that they can come to that person, you, the boss, and you can delegate responsibility to others through their request. You know, make sure with the with the, with the paramedics, you're confirming and updating your evacuation plan, how you're going to get this patient out there. You need to get that, you know, that, that information to them, and you'll, you'll see some of the things that you need to communicate in the next slide. So... <clears throat> Patient evacuation is one of the most critical things and one of the things we really don't do a good job of, I think, in drilling um, often. Uh, 
Um, so here's the thing. It is the biggest challenge in maintaining effective BLS care and, and frankly also ALS care. Right? If we can't evacuate this cardiac arrest patient in a highly managed, effective, professional manner, then we're going to have our BLS and ALS treatments suffer. And with a cardiac arrest patient, you know, how long can we interrupt compressions? 10 seconds, right? Every second counts. And so patient evacuation has to be well thought out. You know, one of the things that if you have somebody who's on patient transport, if that's their job of getting basically how they're going to evacuate and transport this patient, they should walk the path. They should figure out how am I going to move this patient? You know, you need to move also a ton of equipment, right? And yes, the patient, right? If you just have two people um, and you're performing CPR, this is a nightmare. I don't know how it's even effective, uh, possible at an effective high level of quality. And obviously, sometimes you just got to do the best you can with what you got. But if you have the multiple resources we talked about, you need to decide as that, you know, as it comes together, as you start getting ready to move that patient, who's carrying the monitor, right? Who's carrying the jump kit that came in? Who's taking care of, you know, the paramedics uh, bags, right? Because they're going to have drug bags with them. Who is moving the patient to the stretcher? How are you moving the patient to the stretcher, right? All of these things you need to think about. How are we going to get the oxygen bottles? Here's something that you need to think about. Most cardiac arrest, you will have multiple oxygen bottles. And here's another reason you need time management. You need to be thinking in your head, are we running out of oxygen, right? What's our oxygen level? We'll talk more about that. But again, all these things kind of come into play. How do you get all this equipment and the patient and your team out? Uh, and then, so, you know, on top of that, we have movement challenges. Are we going to be dealing with an elevator? Are we dealing with stairs, right? You've heard me say stair chair. And you're like, well, it's a cardiac arrest patient. How are we going to put them on a stair chair? You may have to. And now you're going to think about how do you get them on the chair, get them down a flight, possibly get them off, weeks commit to compressions, uh, and get them back on, right? Or you may go all the way down. You got to do what you got to do. But you need to think about this. Patient weight. Do you have enough resources to lift this patient? Cardiac arrest patients are, are much heavier than, than somebody living and breathing. And I think we all understand that mechanic. But again, and then equipment. How do you keep the monitors attached? How do you keep the BVM attached? If you're using a compression device like a Lucas, how does that stay attached? Does it get pulled off as you're going down a narrow hallway or hit a tree if you're outdoors? Or What are you dealing with, right? Uh, plan evacuation thoughtfully. Right. You have to update job assignments. OK, this person that was, you know, doing uh, secondary uh, airway support. Now they're going to manage the cardiac monitor. Right. Because you don't need to do secondary support because you've intubated and <clears throat> they can take a new job. You need to do that. You need to brief people on what you're going to do. Consider terrain. Are we going upslope, downslope? Is it wet? Is it dry? Is it sandy? Is it rocky? Is there gravel? You know, uh, is the patient going to fall off the stretcher? Right. They're completely placid, right? They're completely just, they have no control of themselves. Are their arms dangling? Have we taken care of that? You know, is there an IV in the arm and we can't bend the arm? What if the arm bends? Is the IV going to get pulled out? You know, these are things you need to think about. Ultimately, will you need rest stops, right? Does the team going to need to rest between where you are and where your ambulance is? Um, will you need quality stops? Do you need to stop somewhere in order to maintain your compression factors uh, in CPR? So a lot here to think about, right? Um, <clears throat> you want to confirm your hospital destination, right? Are you still going to the hospital you thought you were going to before paramedics got there? Uh, and has something changed or is possibly the patient situation changed and you need to decide a different manner of, uh, of transport or destination? Um, so a lot to think about. Um, while you're transporting the patient in the ambulance, you need to think about stop reasons. And some of this should be already handled through local protocols. But if you didn't intubate on scene and you're intubating en route, highly suggest you stop during that. Uh, intubation while the ambulance is moving, bouncing, swerving, and curving, probably not the best thing to do, especially if you're trying to maintain high level of quality. So what are your stop reasons? Um, you know, and how do you, um, you know, try to plan those uh, through protocol versus on a, on a cardiac arrest. But if you have never thought about those before, something you need to think about. Uh, consider your transport times, right? Uh, how long is it going to take uh, to get there? Um, you know, and, and, and the reason for this is uh, the paramedics may not be familiar with your, your, your area. Um, they need to understand how long it's going to take to get to the hospital because this can impact drug decisions. You know, if you difference between your five minutes from a hospital versus 30 minutes from a hospital may change their view of how they want to um, 
titrate their, their, their drug therapy for this patient. So just think about kind of your transport times and you should announce this stuff, right? This is stuff you should communicate as the boss. You should be telling people, here's what we're going to do. Let's be careful about this hill. Let's be careful about that. We're going to take a stop after a hundred yards, 50 yards. We're going to do, you know, we're going to terminate CPR for, for the next 20 yards. And then we're going to restart. What is the plan? You know, our transport time is going to be 15, 20 minutes, whatever, right? Um, paramedics, do you guys want to stop if we have to intubate? Um, what do you want to do? All right, so here's some ground truth. These are just things that didn't really fit into any of the other cornerstones, but I found to be really important in managing cardiac arrest. Uh, first one is, you know, consider a fire department or mutual aid call out. You need resources. So anytime you have a cardiac arrest patient, CPR in progress, consider not just sending your, your ambulance, but sending as many resources as possible. Uh, even if you have police on scene, uh, you need to get other resources there. I think you hopefully through this process of watching this video, you have um, really thought about um, that's come to light. There's a lot of work here to be done with a cardiac arrest patient. Um, shocking the patient, record the times. I mentioned that earlier. You know, it's important for your patient care report. You need to record each time you give a shock uh, and whether it was done through AED um, or not, right? If it's paramedics, they'll record their times, but you can help them out by recording shock times as well. So again, the person who's doing time management can also be doing writing down times, right? They can write down times, they can write down medications, allergies, person talking to the patient's family, if there is a patient family member there, can get allergies and meds, transfer that to the time management person, they can write it all down and now you have your records being built out. Um, you know, if you're doing Lucas or a similar device to a Lucas, uh, first of all, if you don't have a Lucas, find a way to get one. They are absolutely remarkable devices. Uh, but think about how that's going to impact your transport, not just transporting an ambulance or down, down a hallway or through a path or whatever you're doing, but even just, you know, if you have to uh, pick up the patient, how are you going to do that? That should be a skill you practice. It is perishable. Suctioning. How do you suction a patient with a lucus, right? How do you move them? Do you have cervical challenges or not? Um, you know, again, what is primary and secondary to you given the patients in cardiac arrest? Rhythm analysis and shocks, understanding how that works. You may have paramedic come on scene who have never had to deal with a lucus. You may find that strange, but I've had situations where the paramedics were not familiar with lucus. Uh, and it's up to you to, 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 to educate them on, you know, uh, your device and quickly, right? Like if you're going to analyze, we need to stop the device. If you're going to shock, we need to stop. Well, here's how we restart device. Those type of things you need to keep in mind. Um, oxygen levels. Somebody has got to be monitoring oxygen levels. You're going to go through a ton of oxygen in minutes. Um, so again, time management can do that, right? Time management can remind people like we need another O2. Uh, we need this, we need that. Uh, as the boss, you want to make sure that's being taken care of. You know, there's nothing like bagging a patient while paramedics are trying to uh, get fluids or narcotics in, um, you know, intubate, analyze rhythms, and you've run out of oxygen because you're focusing on what the paramedics are doing versus every, you know, minute or two checking your level of oxygen. And then again, once you get into the rig, you need to think about, you know, your oxygen levels uh, and switching over to onboard oxygen. Suction challenges, right? Again, how are you going to suction this patient? Uh, are they on a device or not? Uh, how will you do it? Who calls for suctioning? Those type of things. Uh, and who's doing it, right? Um, ventilation rates. Here's something really important. So we talk 30 to 2, um, you know, as our standard for um, ventilation of a, of a cardiac arrest patient. Uh, again, you should probably go to ACLS. This is, I'm not giving you clinical advice, but as we're monitoring um, the carbon dioxide levels, and, and especially at paramedics, uh, you may receive instructions for different ventilation rates. Uh, once you have intubation done, um, you may find that. So you need to either ask you know, a good thing. Remember, we're all trying to help each other here. So just because the paramedics don't tell you, it just could be they're, they're, they're stressed out as well. Um, and so you may need to say, like, do you want to maintain uh, 30 and 2? Uh, or do you want me to go to, to one and six? Uh, you know, you may be even given instructions, depending on the patient's carbon dioxide level, to go to, you know, one, eight to 10 or something like that, because you're trying to either raise the ECT, ETCO2 level or reduce it. So you need to communicate that to improve the overall quality care that the patient's receiving. Also, with a device, you may change your your, your, your compression to ventilation rates. So you need to know for such as like a Lucas, what is the effective ventilation compression rates? Uh, again, also you can you know, start thinking about if my patient 
is cyanotic, um, and, but yet they don't have gastric distension and I'm getting effective rise, what's going on there and should I change my rate or not? These are things you need to decide and you need to work with your medical director around what to do, but it's something that is important to figure out way before you get on scene as to how you're going to deal with this. Uh, think about failure points. What could go wrong? What could happen? Um, you know, where are my failure points? What are things that are going to go wrong in this call? Um, so this is critical. Uh, here's the most important thing I would tell you, not the most important, but a really important thing that I would hope you take away from this. You need to drill everything we just talked about, right? It's great to listen to this and either you agree or you disagree, or you agree with some of it, you find ways to improve on this, which is I hope, hope to God that that's what you'll do is find ways to take what I've just talked to you about and make it a hundred times better. All the credit to you really at the end of the day is about trying to make us as effective as we can. But you need to have realistic drills. A lot of the drills I see focus on compressions and ventilation, and that's important. We need to be able to assure that we're doing adequate depth and recoil management and we're ventilating effectively. But we don't really, or I don't see a lot of drills where we take these concepts that I've shared with you and bring them all together into a cohesive fashion so that we can get better and better and really think about how do we continually improve, you know, and critique ourselves during a drill. Like, you know, this isn't working, right? Or, or we, we didn't do this or we didn't think about that. You need to remember that the most, the, the, the reality of life here is you're probably going to have multiple resources. You need to manage all those resources effectively without losing sight of the patient. So the more you can do to put together a very realistic drill, I would suggest to you, hey, look, we all get compressions and ventilation. So for this drill, we're going to focus on all of this other stuff. We're going to focus on maintaining patient, uh, evaluating our patient, briefing the paramedics. We're going to focus on how do we swap from, from uh, you know, an NP, uh, OPA to an intubation. We're going to think about how do we deal with, um, you know, ventilation rates depending on, um, you know, what we're doing at the moment. We're going to figure out on um, patient evacuation, how we do this effectively and, and, and have coordinated quality and rest stops. All those things are things that we should be drilling if we want to improve the quality of our patient care. Uh, there is a lot more uh, that I can share with you on all of these things, and I'm happy to to um, to do that, to either do a virtual training or in-person training. Um, but my hope is, uh, is is really ultimately that you take this and it really starts getting you thinking about how you want to manage cardiac arrest. Uh, and, and, you know, obviously there's things you could take away from here for other types of things, such as multi-trauma, uh, multi-system trauma. A lot of this is applicable to that. Um, but uh, again, I'm, I'm hopeful that this made some some difference for you. I know it's a very long video, um, so you know uh, I apologize for that. But there's a lot here, and for me, it's just a lot of those things that we just don't really cover a lot in our our, our training programs. Uh, you know, even our refreshers and the other things we go through, um, you know, are, are, they're great and they're important. Um, but you know, I don't know. I haven't seen a lot where. We really focus on the reality of what we face when we get on scene and how do we do that really, really well. And if we can't manage our scene uh, really well and effectively and manage our resources, uh, then ultimately patient care suffers and chances are the patient's going to be negatively impacted, right? Pretty obvious, pretty simple, um, but yet we don't do a lot about it. With that, stay safe. Uh, thank you and God bless.